everybody, what's good? What's up? Happy Monday. JB here, another Cyber Insight live stream. We're continuing our daily conversation uh, talking about different tips for helping build secure networks. And uh, today's tip, we're going to be talking a little, little bit about management networks and specifically out-of-band management networks. Now, if you aren't familiar with what those are or why you would want to use them, um, then this video is exactly for you. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about their use cases, uh, different types of configurations and best practices in the way that we'd go about implementing them. Uh, and yeah, answer any questions that folks might have that pop up as we kind of go into that. So as always, throw uh, your comments down below and we can chat about that. Uh, and if you enjoyed the video, make sure you hit like and share it with your friends. So. Uh, we're going to hop into the checklist that we've been using as we've kind of been going through uh, all these best practices. Again, I remind you that we're just using this checklist kind of as a guidepost, as a jumping off point into more specific conversations. And so uh, in today's topic dealing with management networks and out-of-band management networks, there's kind of two points that we're going to mention uh, in here, and then we're going to look at uh, some design best practices and kind of uh, some diagrams and stuff like that that might make things make a little bit more sense. So first off, the first control is that uh, you wanna make sure that you are using out of band uh, management network for whatever systems that you have. And when I say out of band management, what that means is a separate network infrastructure and hopefully uh, management tools and things like that that doesn't reside uh, in the same IP space and using the same network equipment that your normal data plane, users, customer traffic, all of those would normally reside over. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why you want to separate that traffic out. Uh, some of it is from a security perspective. Some of it is from a uh, performance perspective. And we're going to dive into that uh, in a, just a few seconds here. Um, but we do want to kind of just hit these right off the top. So... The whole point of this is having a out-of-band management network. Uh, no production traffic resides on that, as I mentioned. Um, and you can kind of do that a few different ways. Uh, you can do that, as I mentioned, from having completely separate physical network devices. Uh, you could also use separate routing tables and stuff like that uh, if you don't have the budget to actually break that out. Uh, but you still could run into some resource contention if you are doing it all on the... Uh, same network equipment. Uh, as I mentioned, big advantage of implementing this is providing support and maintenance to the network in the event that it becomes degraded or compromised from uh, security issues. Uh, one of the things that they mention here, if you don't have an out-of-band management network, is having the ability to have direct console access into uh, these devices. So the console ports on the back of the network devices, if you don't have the ability to build out a whole separate network. As long as you have a way to access uh, the console or management ports on the back of these separate from the regular network, then that is a reasonable workaround, although it's not really exactly what we're aiming for here. Uh, the second control here that kind of goes along with that is making sure that we're using separate IP space for our management interfaces. So if we have a separate out-of-band management network. Obviously, we want to have separate IP space for that. That way, it's going to make it a lot easier uh, for you to do uh, segmentation from a routing perspective and then also to implement different types of network access control access network control lists um, at different points in the architecture. Uh, if your management network is all on, let's say, uh, 192.168 subnet, and the rest of your you know, data plane and, and normal customer traffic is all on a 10 network, then it's very easy to implement access control lists uh, on those network boundaries. It also makes it a lot easier uh, to identify different things in logs and security tools when you have uh, a definitive separation between the subnets. So let's take a look over at some documentation that Cisco has provided uh, that kind of makes things uh, maybe a little bit more clear and kind of uh, hammers home some of the things that we're discussing. So let me just bring 
this up and we'll move over to my browser that has that. We're gonna go into Safari. Okay, and so let's talk about, first off, some of the threats that we're trying to protect against um, when we're talking about implementing these types of separate management networks. Uh, and if you are interested in this particular document from Cisco, don't worry, I actually took it and dropped it in the description of the video on YouTube. So um, if you actually wanna do some in-depth reading in this, you can go ahead and do that. So really, we're trying to protect against unauthorized access. And so having a completely separate network um, helps aid in that. If you don't do that, then you get into the situation of where you have interfaces that might be publicly accessible that you also have uh, management services running on. So for instance, if you had a web server and it was connected out to the internet and you were uh, allowing uh, 443 to that web server, but you also were allowing SSH to that web server, you're kind of opening yourself up potentially for some type of vulnerability. Now, obviously, um, I shouldn't say vulnerability, just some type of risk or some type of malicious actor to be able to access that. Uh, the things that you can do to protect against that is obviously you could implement IP tables or some other types of firewall rules, but let's say something else happens and those rules accidentally get removed or there's some other type of bug or vulnerability in the software that's providing uh, those access control lists, you unnecessarily have a management interface now that could be opened up to the internet. So having it on a separate physical interface, having it on a separate subnet from your public subnets or your data plane subnets adds another layer of fidelity in providing that type of uh, protection. So other things, denial of service, distributed denial of service, um, that's where you're kind of getting into uh, a resource constraint possibility on your network. So if there is some type of attack on your data plane that's causing uh, resource constraints or constrictions, if the only path that you have to get to your uh, management interface or your management services is over a network that's overly saturated because of some type of network-based attack, then you are able to get into the device to monitor it and maybe make some types of configuration changes. Meanwhile, if you have a out-of-band management network, uh, you still would be able to get into that device. Hopefully you have some other types of um, quality of service and uh, other types of security uh, controls as far as uh, denial of service uh, configurations that limit those types of attacks at various points in your architecture, whether that is on your individual device, so maybe some type of uh, control plane policying or something like that, or also on you know your firewalls and other types of security appliances that you might have in line that might be looking for those types of flood-based attacks and be able to protect against that. And we kind of have a few other things that kind of you know continue to go in line as far as other types of security um, events or issues that we would want to, uh, you know, provide some type of protection against, minimize those threats by having that separate network. So what does that kind of look like? Well, I think this diagram here kind of does a good job as far as showing you, this would be kind of your, your normal network here up at the top. So you have maybe an internet and some edge routers, some core devices, data center switches, user switches, and stuff like that. And we would call that all kind of your, your data plane. This would be where your normal traffic, uh, your customer traffic might reside on and things like that. See down here, we would have our out-of-band management network. And so this would be separate network uh, infrastructure. We would have different security tools down here. Um, and you see that there's a few different types of connections that we might have here. These blue connections, uh, might be connections going to uh, the management interfaces on the back of these network devices, right? So these could have IP addresses that are in the management network on those management interfaces and have connections back into this out-of-band management network. The other thing that we could have here is you see that they have these console servers. We could have console connections going up to all of these as well. Uh, that also brings up kind of a, a good secondary or tertiary type of fallback that a lot of organizations will do, which is for remote access to different locations, they might have a separate internet circuit that connects to 
what you might call a jump server or some type of console server uh, that you would then be able to get into and be able to access the console ports uh, to all of these different network devices in the event of some type of failure or security incident that affects your uh, primary circuits into your environment. Here, if we're looking kind of at, at the way that they have it laid out here, it looks like we kind of have a, a VPN connection into some firewalls. These firewalls uh, would have separate routing tables. Uh, so it looks like, you know, you'd have a routing tables for your, your in-band network, and then you'd have a separate routing tables for your out-of-band uh, management network. And obviously, you would have a whole bunch of different security policies between that. The nice thing with separating uh, the routing tables with that is they won't know about each other unless you do some type of route leaking between them. So you can be extremely granular with um, allowing traffic through a firewall when it's configured like that. Uh, and we kind of talked about the best practices, talking about network isolation. We talked about access controls that you would want to have. Um, even on your out-of-band network, you still would want to make sure that only certain IPs within your out-of-band network has access to those management interfaces. Uh, let's see what else they kind of talk about. In-band management best practices. Uh, so that would be in case you aren't able to implement your out-of-band stuff. Kind of talked about that scenario, talking about a web server that has access to the internet. You still would want to have IP tables and other things uh, configured on that for those particular management services. Uh, and then obviously quality of service would be a big thing that you'd want to have as well. And we kind of talked about that, making sure that the management traffic on that network has a higher priority than the rest of the normal traffic. Uh, so stuff like, you know, your routing updates, uh, SSH, other types of maybe syslog and things like that that are important for your monitoring and management uh, would have a higher priority than, say, somebody's uh, web traffic. Right? So those are things that you can go ahead and implement with that. Um, I think that pretty much is what we wanted to hit on for the topic today. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, you can go ahead and drop those uh, in the comment section. I think the topic for tomorrow's video is going to be multi-factor authentication and how we would use that in a network uh, when building out a network to help uh, secure that. And that kind of also would tie into... Um, our topic today a little bit talking about you know out-of-band management networks wanting to have some multi-factor authentication uh with admins remoting into that so we'll kind of dive into that a little bit more tomorrow so if nobody has any other comments or questions i appreciate you all dropping in here make sure you smash that like button if you haven't subscribed please do that and if you're finding this series useful uh, then I appreciate you sharing it with other people because the more people that have some ideas on how to build out secure networks, then the better all of our networks will be. Oh, hey, Kiki, what's up? Appreciate you dropping in. All right, well, I hope everybody has a uh, great rest of their evening and we will all chat soon. All right, bye. Mm -hmm.